Infrastructure Foundations. My name is Rohit Rahi and I'm part of the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure team. In this particular module, we will look at some of the OCI networking services. Specifically, we will look at what a virtual cloud network is, what kind of gateways are available in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, what peering options do we get, what do we mean by security controls within VCN, and we'll briefly talk about load balancer service within uh, Oracle Cloud. So first, first, let's look at what is a virtual cloud network. A virtual cloud network is a software defined private network that you set up in OCI. What do we mean by software defined? What we mean here is you get access to the, to the VCN, but not the underlying hardware because it's all in software. What is the need? Why do we need a VCN? Well, it enables your resources such as compute instances to securely communicate with the internet with other instances running in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or your on-premises data center. So those are the three key scenarios where your instances need to communicate. And for in order to do that communication, you need to have them running inside a virtual cloud network. Well, so what does the virtual cloud network looks like? Uh, as you can see here, I have a couple of instances. Uh, one instance is talking to the internet other instance, and these are talking to each other as well, other instance is talking to your on-premises environment. So in order for us to enable that communication, we take a region, a region has ADs, one or many, uh, one or three, multiple. So in this case, we are showing just one AD. And in this particular uh, example, uh, we create this VCN. And as you can see, the reason we have this as a dotted line is to show this is sort of a logical thing. It's not a physical thing. It's you know, it's a software defined uh, uh, construct, uh, the VCN here. And then, you know, we have these compute instances running inside the VCN. So uh, like we said, uh, a VCN lives within an OCI region and it's highly available, secure, scalable, all done in software. So it gets, it inherit, in, in, inherit all those uh, constructs. Now let's, let's dive a little deeper. Uh, when you create a VCN, first thing you do is you give it an address space. So address space is nothing but a range of IP address that you assign, right? Like in this case, you have this IP address of 10.0.0.0.0 slash 16. Now, what do we mean by an IP address? Well, think about IP address as like your postal address. So uh, this is a unique uh, identifier uh, for all the... Um, equipment, all the assets uh, by which you can identify uh, a, an asset. So typically what happens in an on-premises environment, or at least you know in the, the traditional environment, is you have this concept called a DMZ, demilitarized zone, and then you have your local area network here. And as you, as you know, IP uh, resources, addresses are a precious resources. So many years back, the standards uh, for RFC came up with this idea of uh, our concept of RFC 1918 addresses. And basically these addresses are called private address space. And the idea here was to uh, was to preserve the public IPv4 uh, addresses, the number of IPv4 addresses they, we, we could have, and also prevent overlapping of IP addresses. So these addresses, the reason they are called private is they are not routable on the internet. So your LAN, could use these resources. So if you have a computer here, you have a computer here, you have a computer here, they could all have private IP addresses, but your DMZ can have a load balancer, which will have a public IP address. If you just go and, um, and um, get the public IP address of your local machine, which you are, where you're watching this video right now, you will get uh, an IP address, which is publicly routable. So, so it can be uh, discovered on the internet, right? So that is a public IP. And then uh, organizations have used the private IP uh, uh, addresses. There are three ranges here, and we don't have to go in, in, in detail uh, on, on these ranges. Uh, there is 10.0 slash 8, uh, there is 172.16 slash 12, and there is 192.168 slash 16. Now, again, we don't have to go into all these details, get into a lot of uh, uh, complex site annotations, etc. But the idea here is. Uh, let me just remove 
is one thing. Uh, the idea here is um, that using these um, uh, private IP addresses, uh, you, your resources can still be identified on your local LAN network, uh, but they cannot be routed on the internet. So when we talk about VCNs, what we are talking about are these private IP address spaces, right? So you look at that 10.0.0.0 slash 16, that's a private IP address, right? So first thing you do in a VCN is you assign that private IP uh, address, right? Now it's a range as we talked about, right? So this particular CIDR means it, these are the IP values which you can assign to your resources. Now, every resource that is connected to this VCN, like a compute resource, will get its own unique private IP address. Remember, it's private IP. So the server one has this IP, uh, and this this particular server has this particular IP address. Now, how did we? How did those servers get those IP addresses? Well, the the idea here is you take this big network, and then you divide into these things called subnetworks, smaller networks. Now, why do you do that? Well, uh, first, you, you this, these are the examples here. Um, you could take a bigger network, you could divide it into smaller networks. Well, why would you do that? Uh, the idea is your compute instances are placed in subnets. You cannot put a compute instance just here without a subnet, without in, in just a VCN. You have to create a subnet, at least one. And then subnets can be isolated uh, and secured. And this is one of the big reasons why you would have subnets because you could run security here uh, on, on, on a subnet. Now, uh, let's look at the, the communication pattern we talked about, right? Why did you create a VCN in the first place? Well, we want instances to communicate, right? So the first uh, scenario is communication to the internet, right? So the simplest scenario is you are running a web server here. Let's say this is your web server and you want the traffic to go out, right? It's a web server, it's a load balancer. So in OCI, there's a gateway, which is called Internet Gateway. It provides a path for network traffic between your VCN and the internet, and it's bi-directional. So you can go from here, it can come from the, from the internet. People on the internet could actually discover it, right? It's a web server, you want it to be discovered. You know, uh, folks can, can ping it and, and access it. So, well, you guessed it, uh, this you would put in a public uh, subnet. Uh, also, sometimes people call them as DMZs, not every public subnet, but there is this concept where you put all your public facing assets in a subnet, which is public or a demilitarized uh, zone. Now, on the other side, you might still want to reach the internet, uh, but you want to, to reach it in a secure fashion. So what that means is, uh, let's say you are running a database here and your database needs patching, of course, right? So for it to get the patches, it still needs to go to the internet and get the patches back. But what happens is nobody should, a bad actor should not be able to ping the database from the internet. And so you would use a gateway called a NAT gateway, which enables this outbound connection to the internet, but blocks inbound connections initiated from the internet. So this bad actor cannot reach your database, right? Use cases, updates, patches. Both these uh, these um, gateways are highly available, uh, secure, and scalable. So this is the whole idea of software-defined networks. You don't care about the throughput, uh, whether they are highly available. We manage all that, uh, uh, and we make these fault uh, tolerant for customers. The second scenario is you want your uh, communication to on-premises. Well, you're running in a hybrid mode. Uh, you still, let's say you have a DNS server, which is running right here in your on-premises and your databases need to get the DNS uh, to sync up with the DNS server, right? So what you need to do here is uh, this, this, let's say you're running a database, you need to go to on-prem, right? So in this case, you have another kind of router called a dynamic routing gateway. And it's a virtual router that provides a path for private traffic between your uh, network and destinations other than the internet. So you're not going to the internet right now. You're going to your uh, on-prem environment and you use a router called a DRG. Now there are two kinds of uh, mechanisms um, or two kinds of design you have with a, with a DRG. One is what is called a simple uh, you know, uh, IPsec VPN, also sometimes referred to as site-to-site -site VPN because you're connecting sort of two sites. Uh, and there is another, and this actually goes through the internet, uh, this traffic. But we said that it's a private uh, uh, traffic. So what it means is we encrypt the traffic and that's the IPsec encryption in the name. 
so we encrypt the traffic there now the second uh, second uh, uh, design is ar around using a private dedicated connectivity so think about this as having your own high occupancy vehicle lane uh, if internet is this massive you know um, set of uh, highways and you get your own vehicle lane uh, and it's only for you it's it's private uh, and it's a dedicated connectivity and, and again this is a foundation course so we're not getting into lots of details um, but you can you know, get into a lot of details on how each of these work and the components now there is a third scenario where you want to communicate uh, this time to public oci services like an object storage as you can as you know object storage has a public endpoint it's a public url through which you can access it it's for the storage for the web so let's say you have a scenario where you want to uh, access object storage. Why would you do that? Well, again, as in the previous one, the previous examples, let's say you have a database running here. You want to take backups of those databases. The best place uh, to keep the backups are is, is an object storage, just built for this massive scalability, reliability uh, of data. So you want to do the backups. Now to do the backups, uh, you want to access uh, a public endpoint. Uh, now, by very virtue, it means that this subnet has to be public and this instance needs to have a public IP address and, and so on and so forth, right? So it becomes a security issue uh, if you if you go that uh, way. So we have another gateway in OCI called a service gateway, which lets resources in networks, VCN, access public OCI services such as object storage, but without using an internet or a NAT gateway. So your traffic is not going over the internet. It's still going through the Oracle private network fabric. So as you can see here, uh, we use the instance private IP address for routing, and it travels over the OCI network fabric, never traverses the internet. The use case, you have to back up your database. That's the most common use case. Uh, and there are several other use cases, but this is a way for your services to access public um, OCI, your, your resources to access public OCI services, but not go through public internet. Well, so we looked at the four different kinds of gateway. Uh, going to internet, internet gateway, NAT gateway, different use cases. Uh, we looked at dynamic routing gateway, going to on-premises, going to public OCI services, such as object storage. We looked at uh, service gateway, so four, very common gateways you should know the use cases for each of them now briefly let's look at uh, security so in this case uh, we have uh, uh, we have a uh, similar example as as before uh, we want to uh, we want to secure these instances because remember in the previous slides we talked about the fact that you have subnets you want to uh, secure these uh, uh, subnets and of course the compute instance is running within the subnet so what you could do is you could you could uh, design a set of firewall rules you could put a firewall which would which would say what kind of traffic is allowed in and out of the subnet you could do that now um, security list also apply if this instance wants to talk to this particular instance you need to put a security list here in order to enable the traffic so one uh, thing you need to keep in mind is you create a network you have subnets and these are all secure uh, by default so it doesn't mean that it's, this instance can talk to this other instance just because they are in the same network you have to enable that uh, traffic and then you could do stateful stateless and again we're not getting into lots of details here right so let's look at a couple of examples uh, this first one applies to the web server it's saying port 80 traffic coming from anywhere allow that port ingress meaning it's incoming the second one is applying to this this guy here uh, on on the private subnet it's saying it's egress going out only allow traffic to this particular subnet and only allow traffic on port, port 1521 right so this is how you would secure your networks uh, just think about these as your firewalls sitting on the subnet and controlling access for all the resources uh, offer all the uh, um, resources like compute instances within that subnet now you don't have to always put these at the subnet level we have another feature called network security group basically you could do the same thing but now you could do it at the virtual NIC level so what that means is you could apply nsg just to this particular instance uh, and so on and so forth right so it gives you more granular control uh, of how you handle your security so remember you could 
apply security either at the virtual network interface layer or you could do it at the subnet layer and there are different use cases of when you would use one over another well so that was uh, we talked about uh, um, uh, the the gateways and we talked about uh, security those are sort of the basic scenarios right the one other um, uh, scenario for communication we actually uh, uh, missed uh, in the previous slides right and that's around peering so what i mean by that is let's say you have a region here right the, all the previous scenarios were like focused on one region you have you, you know you have different gateways now let's think about this way in a region let's say you have multiple vcns now uh, you still might have a scenario where these vcns have resources you want to communicate the, who want to communicate with each other why well, um, you know, good example might be that DMZ has its own VCN, right? And your other, uh, your your like your other uh, uh, assets or other projects or other you know units have their own uh, VCN. It's a very valid scenario. So your uh, your uh, VCNs might want to communicate with each other, and so the process to connect these multiple VCNs is called peering. Now, in a peering, there are two kinds of flavors which are possible. One is called local VCN peering. It's in this process, you connect two VCNs in the same region. So you're in the same region. So their resources can communicate using private IP addresses. So this guy can talk to this guy. You create something called a local peering gateway and the communication happens. Now, what if you have VCN in other regions? Um, and we talked about, you know, the fact that many regions have region pairs. So two regions existing in, in the same geopolitical area, or even if they are in different areas, you might do things like global rollouts uh, you might do things like uh, disaster recovery right so you might st still be talking between two different regions so in that case you have this concept or this construct of remote vcn peering similar to local vcn peering but now you're connecting two vcns in different regions so their resources can communicate using private ip addresses now the thing to keep in mind is you have peering here and you have peering here this doesn't mean that the peering is transitive. So it doesn't mean that this uh, uh, compute instance can talk to this compute instance. This kind of communication is not allowed. If you want this instance to talk to this, you have to make a sp uh, explicit peering connection, meaning the peering is not transitive. All right, so we looked at different scenarios um, around uh, gateways and um, security and peering let's look at the last topic in this in this in this lecture around load balancer well why would you use a load balancer in the first place uh, well load balancer is this construct which sits between your users or your clients and your backends right the first thing you would use a load balancer is uh, is uh, so in a, in a load balancer uh, what you do is you requests are coming in from from the clients you do things like service discovery you say what backends are uh, are available and when should we talk to them right uh, you also do health checks so if this one has gone down you, and these are healthy you stop sending traffic to, to 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 them right why do we use a load balancer right well we use a load balancer the first reason is high availability we looked at it in the previous module if these these three web servers go down you still have a web server uh, you, you still have your uh, application running because one of the web servers is running, right? So you do that. Uh, second is scale. One VM can only handle this much traffic or a bare metal machine. If you put four of those, of course you get a bigger bigger scale. So those are the two common reasons why you would use uh, a load balancer. Now in OCI, we have different kinds of load balancer. We have a public, we have a private. Uh, it operates at layer four, operates at layer seven. Uh, you can do things like session persistence, uh, affinity based routing, uh, complex kind of routing. Uh, you can do SSL. Uh, there are lots of lots of features, right? So in this lecture, we are not going through this. I'm just going to show you a common, simple example. So let's say you're running a public load balancer. Traffic is coming in here like this. First thing we talked about is the services, uh, OCI services are fault tolerant. What does that mean? This can become a single point of failure. To avoid that, we always maintain uh, two copies of the public load balancer or the private load balancer. So if this one goes down, this load balancer is still running. You don't have a single point of failure. And then as we looked at the previous slide, this load balancer is basically sending traffic 
to the various backends. In case if this one goes down, the traffic will switch over, the IP will switch over to this load balancer, and, and then and then the, the load balancer will, will still keep sending traffic to the various backends. Well, uh, that's all uh, we wanted to cover on the virtual cloud network. In this particular uh, module, uh, we looked at what a virtual cloud network is, software-defined network, highly available, secure, scalable. Uh, we looked at different kinds of gateways, internet gateways, NAT gateways uh, for sending traffic to the internet, different use cases. We looked at uh, DRG, dynamic routing gateway for sending traffic to on-premises. We looked at service gateway for sending traffic to public OCI services such as object storage. Uh, we looked at peering, uh, both local peering as well as remote peering and different use cases why we would do one uh, versus another. Uh, and then we looked briefly at a public load balancer. Well, that's it, uh, folks. Uh, thank you for uh, your time and joining this, uh, this module. In the next uh, module, uh, we'll talk about some other uh, OCI services. Thank you.